Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, making me sound very pompous or very formal. And I know we want to make it a very uh, interactive session today. Uh, just, just uh, I always, I never pass up an opportunity to speak with fellow practitioners from around the world. Uh, as, you, as Michael said, for many years, I spent uh, my good part of my career on uh, international roles. So, um, and let me just jump straight into uh, some of my thoughts for today, because I think for, I think in a way, all of us, uh, whether in-house or with agencies, are probably fatigued by the amount of negative news that is traveling around the world. Uh, we all know we are in a world of trouble. Uh, where we are in Southeast Asia, it's the same. Um, you know, Indonesia being the largest economy in Southeast Asia is facing, you know, a whole slew of challenges just like everybody else uh, from the pandemic to economic slowdown to joblessness, uh, things. It's just a tidal wave of bad news. But I, I've sort of reflected the advantage of having 30 years in this career is really thinking about what are the opportunities there are in a crisis? Um, and how do we then help ourselves, our organizations and our clients navigate through this uh, crisis? The first thing that comes to mind is uh, communications in a, during a crisis is needed more than ever. Uh, you know, you just think about it. Often we, in good times when, or in boom times, or the economy is chugging along well, we are very often asked to justify our existence. We are asked to demonstrate in quantifiable ways the ROI on everything that we want to do, whether we are on the agency side or on the, or on the client side. So, but in a crisis, and I've seen more than a fair share, um, savvy business leaders and organizational heads know that they need communicators. So this is the time where we need to step forward um, more than ever, because our organizations will be in a battle for relevance, reputation, and results. So, but, you know, the very often multinationals will facilitate between global positioning versus local positioning. I think, frankly, in times like these, every single organization has to justify their existence and their relevance in every local market. So we will need to be very careful in navigating global messaging, regional messaging, and local messaging to make sure that uh, we maintain organizational relevance and reputation. So I, I put this slide together because uh, Cognito ourselves was, was, was born during a crisis. Uh, we were born during the biggest crisis Indonesia ever had, which was the fall of Suharto and the Asian financial crisis in the late 90s. Uh, so the founders were all with an international, leading international agency working in Indonesia. But uh, that organization decided to leave during the crisis. And so they founded Cognito. So that's why I say we are born and bred in diversity. And we always ask, tell ourselves that um, we cannot wallow in self-pity during a crisis. Neither do we indulge in wishful thinking. Uh, we need to steer our company on a pragmatic course and keep on mission for our clients because our clients are uh, themselves navigating a very serious uh, storm. So we need to keep uh, very focused on what we do. But like I said, opportunity for communicators to step forward and lead. Michael, next slide, please. Right. 
so when we talk about leading communications, now more than ever, we have to ask ourselves why. Why are we doing what we are doing? Are we doing going down a route that will get the right outcomes for our organizations? Because more than ever, we will be constrained by lack of resources, will be constrained by uh, a very noisy environment. So we need to be really clear about our audience and we really need to make sure that our channel selection is effective. So, and we often know that we are asked to get things done. But sometimes deep in our hearts, we know that these may be suboptimal, these actions, whether they are at strategic or tactical levels. So we should actually be hunting for uh, efficiency and cost effectiveness, same things that our business leaders are looking for. Because Quite often in the past, I find that when I couch my counsel to business leaders in the language they understand, or in a way that directly impacts their KPIs, that's where we can get things going. Right? Um, next, I wanted to talk about the opportunity to solidify partnerships between the in-house teams and the agencies. So Michael, next slide, please. <clears throat> when this together, I particularly like this uh, picture because, you know, if we don't have two balloons, the two guys are not going to be held up. So um, more than ever, I think, firstly, let me address agencies. I think we have the opportunity to deliver value and impact. Uh, but to do this, we need to be seriously immersed and have uh, some line of sight on what their real challenges and issues are. So we need to go beyond the superficial, really attempt to go down to where their real critical issues are going to be. Okay. Uh, then the question about how flexible can we be in our delivery mechanisms and our pricing mechanisms. Because the reality is, you know, uh, no organization has the luxury of spending unlimited amounts of money without very clear uh, return on investment. So, so that's for the agency side. But for in-house practitioners, I think they, the key onus is really about understanding where your agency can truly deliver value for you. Um, so whether it's sometimes we use agencies, or now I say we because I was in-house for so many years, sometimes we use agencies for only strategic counsel. Sometimes you only use them because we have lack of our team resources. So we use the agencies as arms and legs, as we used to call them. But I think you, in-house practitioners need to be absolutely crystal clear about why they need an agency and to do what, and to make sure that agency has the capability to deliver. Then you can stand and fight for the resources with in-house for for the, for the resources to, to get the agency on board. But I think the most important thing is to look at it um, on a long-term basis. We are going to get out of this crisis just as we have in the past. No crystal ball, we don't know how long it's going to be. I remember in, 19, in 2008 when we had the mortgage crisis, there were a lot of analysts and people who said that it's going to chuck along, it's going to take a new normal, it's going to take 10 years to get out of that. Uh, it didn't take 10 years, right, for growth to resume. Uh, we are, of course, using the word new normal again in this crisis. So uh, I'm not going to join the, the, the gang and try to predict how long it's going to take us to get out of this. 
But I think we need to do, need to have a long-term view on these things. So for example, at Cognito, one of our, our longest client goes back all the way 20 years to our founding, and that's GE. So through the good times and the bad times in Indonesia and with GE, we have stuck together and we have always said that we will work through things together, right? So I think it's important to think long-term. And finally, just uh, to switch direction a little bit, I want to talk about ourselves and talk about ourselves as PR and communication practitioners. Um, I would venture to say, Mike, if you don't mind, next slide, please. You know, I would venture to say that we, not all of us are running 150% as we normally are. So there's a bit of slack. Um, I think th this is the time where we need to, like Stephen Covey says, sharpen our saw. Make sure that our own skills are updated, our teams are developed, and uh, even organizational communications need to get, can be relooked. Okay, the way we impart communication skills to business executives, for example. Um, we are in this situation. We know job openings are going to get scarce. We know that talent mobility around the world is going to get curtailed. Uh, we are already seeing countries turning very nationalistic, even isolation, isolation, isolating themselves. Okay, so that's going to impact the mobility of PR practitioners in moving to different markets. So time to develop local talent. Uh, my, my, Michael said that I was with an international agency before, and that was person Marcella in the 90s. And one wise mentor of mine said, you know, I'll be a damn fool if I didn't use any slack time to upgrade myself. Uh, of course, at person Marcella in those days, there was very, very few times where we had slack time. But uh, nevertheless, his wisdom still holds true. Okay. Um, one of the things that I'm really proud of my Cognito colleagues during these six months uh, is that they have taken it on to themselves to not sit still, but to use this time to actually um, upgrade themselves. So one consultant used the time to actually complete his master's degree. Uh, some have actually taught classes to others. Um, and I'm personally finding that I'm actually having more time uh, to mentor my guys. So it's very important that different ways of doing it, you know, uh, and frankly, I think uh, all our motto should be learn something new every day. Okay, with that, I'm going to stop talking. I'm really more keen to actually have a discussion with those uh, colleagues who are on the call. Uh, just to hear your thoughts and your insights. Uh, Michael, that's okay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much for that insight. Um, you left a lot of things really consider. And I suppose just off the back of what you were speaking about, I'd be really curious to get your insight into what the conversations were like with your clients, especially when the pandemic was escalating and yeah. a lot of change was happening. Um, were those conversations quite different to what you've had uh, before? It's because you were speaking about sort of adding value and showing um, mm. how we as, mm. as PR pros can actually show our value. What were those conversations like and were they quite tough to make them understand where you're coming from? Um, I think most of the time clients are, pretty much working in a situation where information is uh, patchy. So we used to say working, being, and we, as a consequence, conversations we have today may not be valid tomorrow. So uh, example would be, I mean, the hardest hit clients are really in the travel industry 
aviation travel. Uh, so we had to be very practical about things, you know. Um, and one of the things that we had, I remember a conversation with a client who's in the airline industry and he's saying, look, we're not flying. There's not much else we could do. So very practically, we decided to actually um, discontinue our relationship uh, for the time being, uh, actually put it onto the back burner because what they're having is that they're having to fight fires every day. Um, informally on the back, I am still having conversations with them yeah. uh, because I personally think that you know, it will be short-sighted of us to, to um, because purely because we're not being paid to actually not be involved in their, their concerns and their challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I was also interested to know as well, where do you see, especially in Indonesia, um, where is the market opportunity there? Um, to mm. Just speaking about finding new opportunities and, and new things to really embrace and take on what's yeah. the area that you see that's really opening up that the smart agencies are doing? Well, um, you know, it's, it's the biggest market in Southeast Asia. So 270 million people. Uh, I have some of my colleagues on the call now. <laughs> so the Indonesians on the call. Uh, they are uh, people who are hungry for progress. So, and there are a lot of, um, the digital space has been growing over the last five years exponentially, right? There are huge uh, companies that have grown out, homegrown Indonesian unicorns have grown out of Indonesia. So by and large, the, the digital space is going to be, uh, will just be actually enhanced by the current situation, uh, particularly retail and tech use of technology. So technology is going to be big. Uh, the president of Indonesia on Monday spoke about at their Independence Day on Monday. So he spoke about rebooting the economy, uh, particularly in two very key areas. Uh, in the past, certain parts of Indonesia, like Bali, was heavily dependent on tourism, right? Uh, they were also a, pretty much the world's exporter of raw commodities. Um, over the last 10 years, biggest market, no surprise, China. Uh, they are now looking at how to value add on this raw commodities before they are exported. And healthcare is going to be another key area. And I, I personally am hoping that it's really going to make a difference uh, for the future of, our, of Indonesia. It's um, very interesting. And, and for me, just one last question, and then I'll hand over, uh, then I'll hand it over to the floor. Um, just on the internal comm side, here in the UK, um, especially, there's been a lot of conversation about just how that's now becoming so important, and a lot of workforce is being transitioned um, in mm. uh, prioritising um, internal comms. For you at your agency, um, and sort of everywhere around you, is, is that something that's quite similar as well? Um, is the importance of, of ensuring what you're putting out externally is also quite reflective of the internal operation. Yeah. I, I think, you know, in this day and age, there's no segregation between internal and external communications. Uh, it, you know, whatever you say to your employees internally is going to get out there the next minute. Yeah. Right? Through social media. Uh, same thing, whatever you say externally to stakeholders is going to filter back in. So you've got to be absolutely consistent. That is not to say that um, in our case, for example, we know that clients are figuring this out. And like I said earlier, uh, in times of crisis, communications is really going to play a huge role whether to get people, your employees on site, or whether your external customers and your suppliers and uh, 
uh, on site. Give you an example in the in the previous crisis in 2008, I was at Internet, Intercontinental Hotels Group then. Um, what most people don't understand is most of the hotels that is within the ISG brands and groups are actually owned by third parties. So we call them hotel owners. So ISG doesn't own the vast majority of these hotels. Uh, we used to be writing to our owners and updating them on plans and programs once every quarter. During that crisis, we were interacting with hotel owners every week. You know, it's just the same thing. And my view is internal communications, uh, people can take bad news, they just can't take no news. And they will absolutely refuse to accept any half-truths. So you had, we, as management and senior practitioners, we have to decide whether we're actually going to tell them or not tell them. And if we tell them, everything has to be absolutely true. You know? And uh, there's, there's absolutely nowhere to hide nowadays. So we just have to make that hard decision. Absolutely. I thank you for that. Um, I'll now hand over to the floor. Anyone who has questions um, or observations? Steve, go ahead. Yeah, comments, feedback, <laughs> pushback. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm speaking to you, Eric, from uh, uh, our office in London, in, in central London, where the restaurants and uh, bars and pubs are opening up nicely. But I'm a bit of a rarity. Yeah, uh, whereabouts uh, are you guys, Steve? Uh, but we're, we're just near the South Bank, so between London Bridge and Waterloo, just south of the city. Oh, I know um, it well. Yeah, I well, well. I used to be at, uh, you know, Blackfriars. Oh, uh, literally. With just, yeah. Yeah, just... That's about 10 minutes walk from here. Mm. So, uh, yeah, you know where we are. It's starting to come back to life, but I'm a bit of a rarity because I'm in the office. Mm. And amongst our members, the, particularly the consultancies, there, there's, there's a real debate going on what, on what the future of work will look like in terms of office space. So um, I'd be keen to hear what your, what's happening in your part of the world, in particular the, what, what the world of consultancy work will look like in terms of coming into an office? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I have my personal view, but I think I have some colleagues on the phone, on, on the line with us. Um, Tanti, you're there? Okay. So? <laughs> yes. Yes, Eric, I'm here. So, so Tanti, what do you tell Steve of your experience from working from home for the last few months? Oh, it's a very um, interesting experience, but also um, humbling experience at the same time. Because, you know, like, um, then we realized that at first we think it's going to be impossible for us to actually be productive while, while we are working isolated in our uh, bedroom or uh, in our house. But then... Um, through the collaborate, collaboration is really um, we can really make it through a collaboration and self good self management then our worry about the being not afraid of being not able to deliver the work um, with um, same at least same quality uh, with being work in the office is actually not proven we can deliver the same even better quality of work even though we are not working at the office together thanks to the internet and the mentor from eric as well always guiding us through the way okay yeah. you don't have to say good things about me <laughs> <laughs> um, that's true <laughs> But Steve, I mean, the, the other perspectives, as you know, I think it's going to vary between markets because um, particularly markets in Southeast Asia and Asia and broader Asia, uh, the, the social element of work is very important. Uh, so many people actually come to work in their office uh, more for their companionship the social interaction that they get 
So I'm particularly uh, watchful over um, any feelings of isolation uh, among my guys. Um, the office is open for all intents and purposes. We do have people, a skeleton crew in there, but um, my advice to everyone is go into the office to do what you absolutely need to do and then get up, get, go home. Um, the reason is not so much the off we are worried about the office per se, it's about commuting. Because uh, as you may know, Indonesia has a huge traffic problem, right? Um, so we were, we were actually saying, look, if you don't have to expose yourself in the public place by commuting and public transport, don't do it, right? Uh, but I'm like you, Steve. I'm personally, if you're given a choice, I'll be in the office. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. That's great. Thank you, guys. I think we've got a question um, from Jolina. Hi there. Yeah, hi. Hi, everybody. This is Jolina from Singapore. I want to just look back to uh, Eric's point on qualifying partnerships. So, mm. GHC Asia is an agency that specializes in travel, tourism, cruising. Mm. So all of our clients are affected, which means the agency is very badly hit. So I was intrigued by the fact that you said, you know, mm. the clients need to have a long-term vision beyond COVID-19 mm. on the value of partnerships. That we're at a stage right now uh, where the clients can't see beyond payroll and yeah. utilities to keep the hotel going. So what we've done is we've diversified the business into uh, uncharted waters where we don't normally venture. So that's what we're doing just to keep things going. But like you, we're also having that back-end conversation with the tourism clients just in the hope to get them to reappoint us when things get better, but we don't seem to be having any success. Oh, B, or what, what kind of conversations are you having with your aviation client that you want to keep that? you know, interest going into the future because right now there is a matter of survival for all of them and Correct. we're just Correct. trying to see if we should slowly diversify it out of tourism or what would be your recommendation, Eric? Um, I think, well, for us, Jolina, it's, it's um, in a way we are blessed because we are not uh, dependent on any one particular sector. So we have consciously diversified our portfolio over the last uh, five, six years. So that's, that's, part, that's part, part of the, the strategic direction we took, uh, rather than focus on particularly some agencies have rushed into digital, some have gone very heavy into tech. So we have intentionally kept a very diversified portfolio. That's one. Um, I feel for you because I think currently the situation with the travel guys and I, like I mentioned, I spent quite a few years during the last crisis with ISG and we were, uh, we, we had the same thing. Occupancy rates were down 20 to 20%, 30% uh, and further back SARS and everything else. So I think it's one of the things if, uh, possibility that you could think about is um, work on a pay for play basis for the time being. So as they reposition themselves, uh, even the hotels have to think of new ways to generate income. The tourism spots are thinking of new ways of doing it. Uh, I think we need to keep in step with them. And that's, that's uh, one of the key things. Um, if you could think in terms of adjoining agency competencies for your, for your own business, that could be something that you want to think about and move into. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your time. No worries. Great. Um, we're already um, at 12.35 here, uh, London time. Um, any final comments or, or questions from anyone who's online? No, we'll um, wrap it up. Uh, Eric, any final uh, comments from you? Um, anything 
to leave us with? Uh, no, well, just this, keep charging guys. Um, like I said, frankly, during, and my guys think I'm really weird for saying this, uh, but I always tell them that during a crisis, that's where you, you really prove yourself. So we have, uh, my partners and I have seen it. We don't take it lightly. We don't take any crisis lightly, but neither do we, you know, allow ourselves to fall into utter despair. We just really use it to force ourselves to think in terms of where can we move forward, both for ourselves and for our clients.